2025 marks the 200th anniversary of the Stockton and Darlington Railway. Opened on the 27th of September 1825, this line is known as the Cradle of Railways. Other lines had pioneered the steam engine, public access and even passenger services, but it was this railway that combined the era's many innovations into a successful enterprise. It sparked the rapid growth of train travel not just across the UK, but around the world, reshaping travel and transport forever. This is where the railway age began, the Stockton and Darlington Railway. At the turn of the 19th century, coal mining was an important industry around country Durham in the northeast of England. Coal was transported by ship to London, where demand had increased with the start of the Industrial Revolution, with mills and factories running on steam-powered machines. To reach the River Tees and other harbours, however, coal was moved on low-quality roads by horse carts, which was slow and expensive. A canal was seen as the best solution. First floated in the 1760s, it was not until 1818 that the idea gained traction. Edward Peace, a retired wool merchant from Darlington, was not pleased with the proposal as it bypassed his hometown. He called a meeting in November to discuss alternate possibilities. Welsh tramway engineer George Overton was invited for consultation. He had designed the Merthyr Tram Road, where Richard Trevivick built the first steam locomotive at the Penny Darren Colliery in 1804. However, the route he proposed for Durham was for a horse-drawn line, as had been the original intent behind Merthyr. This idea was decided upon, and in March 1819 a bill was presented to Parliament for the railway. However, it didn't get through. The route ran through the land the Earl of Darlington used for fox hunting, and through his influence it was opposed by 13 votes. As Overton surveyed a new route, avoiding the land, it seemed likely to pass, so the Earl changed tactics. Jonathan Backhouse was to be a major investor in the railway, and ran Backhouse's bank. The Earl ordered his tenants to secretly collect banknotes, so he could demand they be turned into gold at the same time. Knowing the bank wouldn't have enough, he intended to trigger a loss of confidence and bankruptcy. Backhouse caught wind of the plot and rushed to London to borrow as much gold as he could. Three miles from home, the front wheel of his carriage broke off, so he balanced the gold at the rear, steadying the coach and arriving in town before the Earl cashed in, and got all the gold he requested. Meanwhile, Overton completed his new route, which was presented to Parliament on the 13th of September 1820. It got through unopposed and was given royal assent on the 19th of April 1821. The Act permitted the building of a public railway that could be used by anyone with a suitably built vehicle, more similar to a canal than most tramways of the day, which only served whoever built it. This railway would pull not just coal, but serve multiple industries. It was not the first to do this. The 1796 Lake Lock Railroad in West Yorkshire held that title, carrying private coal as well as timber and limestone. Others had also done similar, but this was to be the most significant yet. With royal assent in hand, the company turned to organisation. The railway's crest was designed, and on the 12th of May, Thomas Maynell was appointed as the first chairman. He and Peace made the decision to drop Overton from the project in favour of a more local and innovative engineer, George Stevenson. Stevenson had been the engine right for the coal mines in Killingworth. Having started in 1811 improving their pumping engines, steam engines used to remove water from mines. He had built his first railway locomotive in 1814, which would come to be named Blutcher, able to pull 30 tonnes at 4 miles an hour. He kept innovating from there, soon providing locomotives to other tramways, and aiding in the construction of new lines. Under his guidance, the Hetton Colliery Railway became the first in the world designed to run without animal power, using locomotives and stationary incline engines. Stevenson advocated for similar on the Durham line, telling Peace steam engines could move 50 times as much as horses, and was brought on board. With help from his 18-year-old son, Robert, the line was resurveyed in 1821, and they found a route three miles shorter than Overton's. The new proposal saw the line gauged to 4 feet 8 inches, the same as Killingworth. 
Stevenson's later railways would add a half inch, allowing extra clearance on tight curves between the wheels and the rails. This would later be adopted as the standard for railways in the UK and many other countries, with the Stockton and Darlington updating to this in 1850. He also changed the rails used. Most wagonways of the time used wooden rails, but for the heavy engines, Stevenson used cast iron rails and held a patent for a type that easily fit together. However, he decided to forsake this in favour of fish-bellied wrought iron rails, which were stronger and would last longer. He was soon appointed as the Stockton and Darlington's engineer, and a ceremony was held on the 23rd of May, 1822, for the laying of the first rails at St John's Well in Stockton. 1823 saw Stevenson's revised bill pass through Parliament for the shorter route and use of locomotives, as well as the conveyance of passengers. However, this was not intended to be done by steam. In 1807, the Oystermouth Railway had become the first fare-paying passenger railway, selling tickets to transport people by horse-drawn coaches. The new railway would do the same, with private companies using horses on the line. The Stockton and Darlington was now posed to be a combination of railway innovations. A public line, built for the steam locomotive, using wrought iron rails, with access not just for the coal industry, but for anyone to run business between the towns it passed, whether goods or passengers. The 26 mile main line stretched from the coalfields of Etherley and Witton to a newly built quay in Stockton, with branches into Darlington Centre and Yarm. It was designed as a double track railway, with infrastructure built to support two lines. However, to save time and money before opening, only one was laid initially, with passing spots every mile. Similarly, money was saved by rejecting Stevenson's desire for all sleepers to be made of stone, which would improve stability and durability. Instead, east of Darlington, locally sourced oak wood was used. One of the first major engineering feats was the Gornless Bridge, completed on the 23rd of October 1923. It was an early iron truss bridge designed by George Stevenson. Originally built with three spans, severe winter flooding damaged the structure, which was rebuilt with four. This failure led to the committee appointing a different engineer for the bridge over the River Skern, Ignatius Bonomi, County Durham's bridge surveyor. His stone arch still stands today, and is the oldest railway bridge in the world in continuous use. Meanwhile, at Newcastle, engine builders Robert Stevenson and company had opened its works, financially backed by Edward Peace. The company's first order for the railway was for two locomotives and two stationary engines. The stationary engines arrived first and were installed on the hills at Brusselton and Etherley. They wound ropes to haul wagons up and down the inclines, which were too steep for the railway engines, linking the main line to the collieries. On the 13th of May, 1825, Timothy Hackworth was appointed the railway's first locomotive superintendent, recommended by George Stevenson. Hackworth had worked as a blacksmith at Willem Colliery, where he helped build and maintain Puffing Billy, the world's oldest surviving steam locomotive. After, he was hired at the Newcastle Works, overseeing operations while the two Stevensons were absent. Hackworth would become invaluable in the regular operation of the Stockton and Darlington, in charge of repairing engines to keep the line running. The 17th of September saw the delivery of the line's number one steam locomotive, Active, better known by its later name, Locomotion. Transported in pieces on free trolleys, the engine was assembled at Eycliffe Lane, now the site of Hayington Station. It was the first engine to have its driving wheels connected by coupling rods, improving traction and reducing wheel slip. It cost £600 to build. When Active was assembled, its fire was lit and a test run was made, taking the engine from Eycliffe to Shildon. It performed without issue. Not long after, on the 26th, the coach experiment arrived, the first passenger coach built to be pulled by a steam engine. But it wasn't the only seating prepared. Coal wagons had been outfitted with temporary seats in preparation for the many guests coming to the opening ceremony. The day after experiment arrived, September 27th, marked the opening of the railway. It drew attention from across the country and a holiday was declared in Darlington to allow locals to watch. The event began at 7 o'clock. 
when 12 wagons were round down from the colliery by the etherly inclined stationary engine. At the bottom, a truck of flour was attached, showing the railway served not only coal, but farms and other industries. The train was brought by horse over the Gornless Bridge, then over the Brusselton Hill, arriving into Shildon. 21 wagons had been fitted with seats for workmen and the public to ride in, alongside experiments which was reserved for the directors. People bought tickets at the Mason's Arms pub, making this the first ticketed passenger train pulled by a steam engine. Room was made for 300 passengers, but there were almost 600 people on the inaugural journey. Some even ended up sat on the coal wagons. Brakesmen, wearing blue sashes, were positioned between wagons to operate their manual brakes, and on the engine were George Stevenson as driver and his brother James as fireman. Active set off for Darlington, hauling between 80 and 90 tonnes, with a horse running ahead to ensure the line was clear of people and animals. The first part of the line was downhill, and Active was able to reach a speed of 12 miles an hour. However, this run was delayed by a wagon losing a wheel and having to be removed. The engine also experienced a fault, and had to stop to be repaired. The arrival in Darlington, a run of 8.5 minutes, took 2 hours, but excluding the 55 minutes of delays, the train made a journey in just over an hour, with an estimated 10,000 people gathered to see them. While the engine was refuelled and the crew took refreshments, six wagons of coal were sent down the branch line and distributed to the town's poor as a gesture of goodwill. As passengers switched places, a brass band from Yarm boarded two wagons behind experiment. They would provide musical accompaniment for the rest of the journey, conducted by the railway's own chairman, Thomas Maynell. The train set off again at half twelve, making its way over the Skern Bridge. Active travelled at an average pace of 8 miles an hour, but was able to reach a top speed of 15. A stop was made at the Yarm Branch, where the other six coal wagons were detached, and, like the others, delivered to the local poor. When the train reached Stockton at half three, it was greeted by a 21-gun salute. The train stopped at St John's Well, as the quay had not yet been completed. 102 people were invited to a banquet at the town hall, where Maynell led 23 toasts, celebrating the industries the railway would serve, and closing by honouring George Stevenson, although by that time the engineer had already left, having had an exhausting day. But it had been a successful one, the first public passenger train pulled by a railway engine. Despite the mishaps, the journey was a triumph, and had proven what the railway could do, serve multiple industries, carry hundreds of passengers, and travel faster than any land transport like it. Soon, railways like it would start appearing across the country, but the Stockton and Darlington was still only in its infancy. With regular operation, challenges and expansion were soon to come, with its trials and triumphs continuing to set the groundwork for the future of railways. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next part. Or just click the thing if it's already out.